Good afternoon, guys. How are we Good doing? Good afternoon. Hey there. I'm freezing, but I'm doing all right. <laughs> yeah, it it is unseasonably well. I guess it's 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 unseasonably cold for awesome, but yeah. it is winter, and I feel like this is the actual winter weather that we've gotten. But uh, Rich, you would probably find it humorous because the if there's any any you know ice on the streets, the entire city shuts down. It, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, no, I mean, I live in California, so similar. It snowed once since I've lived in California. I've lived here over 25 years, so I, I hear you. And it's pretty cold here right now. It's like in the 20s or 30s, so I get I get it. I don't know what's going on. Well, we're really excited to have you on the show today. And uh, we like to start off with good news stories, which we all share a personal or work-related Good news, something positive in our lives that's happened in the last couple of weeks. Who wants to kick us off? Well, I, I'll go then. I'll go. My my good news is while it kind of relates to what we started talking about, it it is freezing in Austin, Texas, but we still have power and electricity, which as is as funny as it might sound, that we could actually lose power for days. That has actually happened <laughs> in the last few years here. So, uh, so that's my good news. Hopefully it stays that way. Yeah. We already started, uh, stocking up water and like pots. So hopefully it doesn't get to that. <laughs> I can, I can go next. Steven, you'll have to, you'll have to keep this on the DL. So Rich, if you didn't know me and Steven are cousins, but I just found out today and this won't go live for a month. So I think my older brother will be okay with me sharing this at the time that this comes out. But he found out that he's gonna have a girl, so it's gonna be his his second child, and um, it'll be the the first niece in the family. So really excited about that. Oh my goodness, Belinda must be thrilled. Oh yeah, that there's she, a, finally a girl. Yeah, <laughs> she is. Wow. Well, those are two really like personal uh, stories, uh, and so mine was mine's a little bit more work related, but I think really it was really positive news that I was excited about. So. We debuted at Coursera. Uh, we're a fully 100% remote company, although we do have offices that people can go into. So we uh, debuted a new strategy at the beginning of the year, which we're calling local connections. We had an all hands and we encouraged everyone to go to a local shared space. We have a national contract with a shared space provider, Rework. And we encouraged people to go there and we we got people together and we had parties and, and that we had... 400 people going into spaces, interacting, having a great time, listening to our all hands, celebrating, et cetera. And I think we've really turned the corner here on personal connections and people are really excited about it. And so that's been one of the biggest challenges I think over the last couple of years is how the heck do we actually get these personal connections? And we seem like we're on the right track. So I'm really excited about that. How awesome. And Rich, were you, was Coursera fully remote? prior to the pandemic or did this, was this a transition during the pandemic years? It was not fully remote. In fact, I always found it incredibly ironic. I joined in 2019 and we're about getting an education anywhere, regardless of where you live, right? Regardless of your economic situation, et cetera. But yet you basically had to live within 30 miles of the Mountain View office to, to work for us because of the commute issues around that. So when COVID came around, we pretty quickly shifted to a fully remote, um, as of course everyone did, but we embraced that we we're going to do it forever pretty quickly on as well. And that's where we are now. I, I wouldn't call us a hybrid model. We don't ask people to come into the office, but we have offices. And we, you, if you're like, for example, if you lost power, if Brandon loses power and he's sick of his kids, he's a person I work with. He happens to live in Austin and you all live in Austin. He can go to our WeWork space and that's paid for fully by the company and get internet connection and meet up with other folks, et cetera. What an amazing benefit and love that you guys are creating opportunities for people to connect and working on making it like an organic part of, of work. And so that's, that's amazing. Well, we have a lot we want to dig into today, and but we'd like to start with just getting a little context around you as a person and professional. You've been a chief people officer for almost a decade, and prior to that, you you're an executive at other tech companies like Yahoo and eBay. So share with us your journey. Like, tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll definitely give you the small version of it because we could spend hours to talking about me. <laughs> Just kidding. 
so um you know and i listen I, I listen i'm a good listener of your podcast and i, I love it by the way and then a lot of times i think you, when i hear people on they'll talk about oh i i wasn't in hr I, it was an accidental hr person i'm the opposite i went to school wanting to be an hr person and pretty early on in my life i figured out i was interested in doing this ironically I have a, a lot of people in my family are in HR. So my my stepmother, my father, my wife. <laughs> so there's wow. a lot of people. Yeah, there's a lot of people in the family that are in HR. So at any rate, I went to school wanting to be in HR. My first job out of college, out of undergrad, was working with a consulting firm, a compensation consulting firm called Radford Associates, which is owned by Aon. Does a basically high tech compensation consulting. After I finished doing that for a couple of years, I, I worked in a manufacturing environments. Actually, when they used to manufacture things in the Bay Area, and then. My first real tech job was working for a company called Bay Networks, which was a, a technology software vendor that that basically was the same thing as Cisco, but in a different perspective. And then after Bay Networks, I got my first head of HR job. This was in 1999. Everyone was hiring like crazy. I had never even been a director before, and I got an opportunity to run HR for a 300-person company that was about to go public. And it was amazing, and it was really exciting. And then in 2000, we crashed. Like everyone else, the bubble burst. We had to lay off a whole bunch of people, and so I went through that whole life cycle. After doing that for a few years, I, w- I had an opportunity to go work with eBay, which was really why I saw real transformational work. I did a bunch of things at eBay. The biggest thing I did that I would say was notable over my period of time at eBay is I led the HR due diligence and M and A work, and so got to work on a significant amount of deals through that period of time and integration in that perspective, including. The Skype deal. So when eBay bought Skype, I was on that deal. I got an opportunity to move to London and become the first HR director at Skype during that period of time. Wow. And, and we scaled like crazy during that period of time. And so that was really exciting. Came back from from that amazing opportunity in, in London and then went to Yahoo. And there I, I held a couple different jobs, but the majority of the time I spent was working with the COO organization who had all the business related functions across the company. So half the company basically turned this person. And when you think about back in the old day, Yahoo's front pages and all the technology itself from that perspective, the programming that came in all those pages, all the business sales, marketing, all those pieces. Um, and so did that for gosh, six years or so. And then became chief people officer at a company called Gigamon, which is a cybersecurity company, which we went, we also were lucky enough to go public. And it also went private over a six-year period. And now I've been at Coursera for four years. I just finished, just completed my fourth year like two days ago. So as the chief people officer as well. Congratulations. And yeah. what, Daniel, we need to put another notch on the intentional HR person. That's that, it feels like that there's less, we have less guests that fall into that bucket, but uh, but that's that's amazing. And was there one, you know, apart from working on the eBay M and A team, and God, what an epic time and mm-hmm. epic company to work for in that specific role? Like, mm-hmm. are there, you know, over that period of time, are there any other kind of roles or opportunities you had that were kind of transformational and how you view the people space? Well, that's a really great question. Uh, you know, I think that um, I think when I look back at when I look back at my career, there's five or six times when technology completely changed our world, and you know, I've had careers during those periods of time where that's happened. And so, when you think about this transformational time at eBay, yes, that was the case. But you also think about the transformational times that were happening during during the days at Yahoo. Now, Yahoo was um, I don't know. I mean, I can't speak for everyone in the world, but it's the first place I ever went online was Yahoo, like in my life, (laughs) right? Very first place. And so I, you have this emotional attachment to those types of things, right? And so working for Yahoo and working for a company that's trying to fight the good fight against really strong competitors that are coming in and doing a lot of different things, whether that's Google or Facebook or Microsoft, et cetera, and helping, you know, when I was at Yahoo, we had, I was there for six years. We had six CEOs. We had Microsoft try to buy the company at one point. We had that. at least twice, if not three times, activist investors. We had the founders take over at one point again. Um, all, all, every single time, it was how can we quickly pivot this organization and move in the direction that the new leader wants to come. So I think that period of time is where I learned how to be incredibly nimble and quick and resilient 
which is a huge part of being a chief people officer, I can tell you, is you have to change your, sometimes you have to change your strategies and then tactics really quickly. And that's, that's a lot of what I saw when I was at Yahoo. That must have served you very well over the last few years in particular, because it's been challenge after challenge after challenge. And we'll come back to that a little later. And so for, for our audience, how would you describe what, you know, if if you ran into a random family member you hadn't seen in a while and they're like, oh, you know, what have you been up to? How would you explain what Coursera does to, to, to this family member? You know, it's, it's, it's actually Coursera. I'm so excited to be at Coursera because it's a company where it has such a good, strong consumer brand that I don't, I don't really have to struggle to explain Like we're an online education company. Most people who are lifelong learners have heard of it. When I told my family members I was going, I have two two sisters who are lifelong learners. They immediately are like, "Can we get access?" Which we do. We we have a we have a benefit there where we allow friends and family, so we can have up to three people in our family or network join, and as well as myself, have access to the content. So that that that's pretty that's pretty easy to describe. You know, I think our business model is a little more complex. So if you get into the more details, it takes a little bit more to describe how we make money and et cetera. But but I think the brand, the consumer brand is so strong. And you mentioned, Stephen, you're a sports fan. You, like ESPN is always running Coursera ads. So I'm sure you've seen them a bunch as well. So, And the difference between Coursera and some of the other platforms out there is that you, you don't have, you don't focus solely on technical skills, mm-hmm. right? As you put it, whatever a lifelong learner would want to educate themselves about, that's what you guys do, right? Yeah, I think that's right. We're a platform more than any other of our competitors. I would say we're a platform where we have over a hundred, I think it's 110 million registered learners on our platform. So we have the best universities, the best industry partners, whether it's Meta or IBM Data Science or Google, who come to us and want access to our learners because we have such this wide breadth of learners. There's some cases where this isn't a true fact, but for the most part, we don't create any content. Um, mm-hmm. Our university partners create the content, or we have subject matter experts that do guided projects that create the content, or we have industry partners like Meta, IBM, uh, Salesforce.com teaches how to be a salesperson, et cetera. Intuit teaches how to be a bookkeeper. All these types of transformation certificates that we have as part of our product portfolio, we don't teach those. We we offer the platform and the technology and the experience, and also the ability to gain students into those into those courses. So that's that's really one of our biggest differentiator. Are there any and, uh, are there any courses that you've taken that our audience would be surprised to hear that you've taken? Wow, that's a great question. I I've taken that you'd be surprised. Well, you know, um, I'm I'm gonna forget the exact name in the course, but there's a capstone course that's taught um, uh, was was taught when the Ukraine war first broke out, and it was taught by the Ford School of Business out of Michigan. And it it was a set of six to 10 individuals who have lived in the Ukraine region who teach at this institution, which is the University of Michigan. And they're basically explaining the last 50 years and why there's a conflict going on. And so the hidden secret around me is, although I checked the box immediately that I want to be an HR person, I probably really wanted to be a history professor, but I didn't know what that would lead me in life. So I felt like better off to go into business. So, so maybe that's one that I took the entire history of the Ukraine Russian conflict. But if I, but I, I thought the question you're going to ask with people ask me all the time, like what question, what class should I take on Coursera? And by the way, anyone can take a class on Coursera for free. There's a fee to, um, if you want to get an assessment and get credit for it, but the, you know, the science of, of learning, learning how to learn is an incredibly good one. AI for everyone by one, our founder, Andrew Ng. Mm. There's so much discussion happening in AI right now and really understanding what's the basis and the science behind it. Those things I think are really important to think about. I'm definitely going to have to check out the AI class because of I, I feel like the last five episodes of the Modern People Leader, we've talked about AI in some way, shape or form, chat, GPT. I forget the name of the cool tool that Daniel uses. He Jasper that yeah yeah, yeah. He, he loves that tool. So why should we be jealous of your day job at Coursera? So I think that um, I I mean the sort of the best way to describe that is I, every organization that is trying to compete for talent in today's world talks about their mission and being mission driven. And by the way, I fully support and believe that everyone believes that mission is important and, and is, is connected to it. 
But I can tell you at Coursera, it's real. We change lives through learning. And we routinely will put up stories from our learners where the entire virtual room is in tears about how, how taking courses on Coursera has changed theirs and their families' lives. And, you know, in my career, when I was working for some of those bigger companies we were talking about, I did a lot of work in emerging countries where you have sets of employees working there, big groups of employees, and they're highly productive employees. And when, like, for example, you'll be walking up to an office space, which is state of the art, and not only is Yahoo there, but Microsoft is there, Workday is there. There's all these companies that are there employing these folks. The reality of the situation where they're living is you have these individuals who have access to education, who have these amazing jobs, and you look literally to your left on the sidewalk, and there's a family of five with a pot and a shack, and that's where they're living their lives, and they'll never have access to that education, but Coursera allows that, right? And so like, what makes... I think people should be jealous of, of why I get it. I'm so privileged to work at Coursera is my entire career has been, you know, centered on trying to solve talent gaps, but like this is a company that's doing something about it and doing it from a perspective that we can change the world. So it, it's very, very real. You can taste it almost in our culture and how real the mission driven is board members talk about it. And that's why they're on the board all the way down to the, to the, the entry level engineer. Like, so it's a huge part of how we operate. Speaking of of life changing, I'm, I'm sure that people even internally at Coursera have been able to change their lives from from some of the the courses that they've been able to take. So I'm curious, being a learning tech company, I I imagine that you'll do quite a bit of of dog fooding. It sounds like you've taken advantage of of a lot of the courses. Are there any you know learnings from the stuff that y'all are doing internally that y'all have been able to share with your customers? Yeah, we have a. Uh, we have a strategy that we call customer zero and customer zero to us means we, we don't want products to go out into the marketplace until we've tested it within our own employee base and really understood it. Sometimes it's called dog fooding. Sometimes it's called you can drink your own champagne, either way you want to look at it. It's an incredibly part of our process and how we think about it. And we've used it a lot and it's been in different, you know, I'll give you these learnings in a second, but it's been interesting when I first joined Coursera, what we were doing was focusing on and have everyone in the company take a class for the year. Like just take one class a year. And we got it 100% two or three years in a row. But what we did over, over the last several years is start to take a look at our, our populations and create skills rubrics for each organization. So to answer that fundamental question that everyone has, what does it take for me to develop here? And what, what it takes to develop in, a, in an organization sometimes is very nebulous and subjective. And so we've laid out skills rubrics for most of our positions, not all of them, of course, but for most of them, where we have, here's what are the skills that we believe you need to demonstrate to be at levels within the company. Now, it's, that's a very important point. You need to demonstrate them. Not that you take a course on them, but you need to demonstrate them. But by the way, if you want to understand how to demonstrate here, here's a set of courses and pieces of courses that you should take on Coursera that'll give you the instructional pieces to understand what that skill is and how you do it, and et cetera. And then you need to take that and working with your with your leadership team, demonstrate that. And so we call that skill up. And we have we measure that on how many Coursarians take a course on a monthly basis or, or take a por portion of a course, have a learning moment on our platform. We shoot for anywhere between 20 and 25% a month of our employees are, are taking those courses. And so skill up has been something that's been really great for us to learn from that perspective. But the, but the biggest learning on all of this by the way, is it's great to develop these and to use them as a way to help people develop. But when you can take them and start to use them in your hiring process, then it's going to really have the connective tissue and connect um, from that perspective. And so that, we're, we're working on that. I don't think we're there yet. I think most um, employers are struggling with that, how to take skills and put it into a hiring perspective. But I think that's going to be the next logical place where we go. Yeah, we, we recently, so actually the last episode that we published was with Allison Baumgates from sure. uh, Semperverance. One thing that she's really bullish on is breaking away from traditional job descriptions and for focusing more on skill-based hiring, skill mapping. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like you're, you're spot on and y'all are onto something. Is there is there anything that y'all are doing at Coursera on the internal mobility front? This is something we're we're hearing more more frequently the last couple of months. I feel like almost every conversation we have, internal mobility is brought up. So I'm curious if there's anything y'all are doing. 
Well, that's that's a great question. When I, we think about it, we use Skillup for that piece. So, okay, so we've defined these rubrics of how of what it takes to develop yourself in each one of these organizations, and then we go back to our learning platform and say, this is how you gain those uh, that expertise and knowledge. And so, one thing we do is with Skillup. The other thing that we've done is we've created, you know, when we came and are we out of the pandemic? Of course we are. But when we came out of all of us being locked down for a long period of time, the last thing we all wanted to do was take an online course or training in general. It was very strong. I mean, I don't know how you all felt, but it was like, there was a lot of fatigue <laughs> in, in that. Sure. And so we were struggling with how can we help connect these dots and give people the space and the time to be able to, to absorb this training? Because there's no question that you have to be exposed to the skill and then you have to learn to demonstrate the skill. And both of those have to happen. But getting exposed to a skill, people feel like they don't have time. So we created dedicated learning days, which we have no meetings for that day. And we encourage everyone to, to take courses or talk to their mentors or generally work from that perspective. And that's been really helpful. We've also created, as a response to um, the thing about being people being so burnt out and so, you know, it's been such a long haul for everyone. We created a lot of companies were doing a day of rest here, a day of rest there. We decided to combine it all. So we do two global weeks of rest a year where we just shut down the company. Now you can't completely shut down Coursera because we have learners. So there's a little bit of support that has to happen. And those people take time off at a different time and we make sure that happens. But, but we do shut down the company completely. And you know, what's really interesting We've seen our skill up access go up dramatically during our global weeks of rest. So people are taking those opportunities to learn and grow and develop their careers. Um, so those are the things we've seen. Where we've seen the best traction is we've partnered with Salesforce.com on a how to be an, a sales development representative, how to be an SDR. It's a certificate that you can get online. And what we've seen is we've had, we've been able to bring people in through that program and develop and and a majority of our best serving SDRs have graduated up to being mid-market salespeople and now becoming AEs and et cetera. So we're seeing a progression of people who come in from little to no experience as an SDR all the way up to being a highly functioning uh, AE within the company. And so we've seen that happen as well. I need to take that course. I uh, Being being a two-man company and you know trying to sell sponsorships... Uh, I I'm rusty. I haven't done any SDR work in like, you know, seven, eight years. I need to freshen up. So I might be taking that course. And you know, the person who kicks off that course might be dear near to your all's heart. It's Mark Cuban. What? So, oh, wow. Yeah. So he, <laughs> oh, he, yes. he's so in that in the first part of that course. I'm a big, uh, I, big Mavericks fan. So yeah, same here. I'm definitely going to have to take it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, given that, that Coursera, has 110, you said 110 million learners, right? Yeah, and I'm sure, yeah, I think that's, it grows every day. So I, yeah. that's directly correct. Yeah. A lot of learners. There are a lot of learners at Coursera. And I'm just curious, are, are there any skills that you see as the most in demand for, for jobs in 2023? Yeah, great question. And we typically sp split those into what's traditionally known as soft skills versus more technology skills. And what's interesting is when we look at this each year and we've re produced some reports on this each year and, and that we do publicly, um, the soft skills haven't changed. Like those are really consistent year over year, how to, how to collaborate, how to be a leader, et cetera. We have, and, and as we're, we think we'll continue to see, switch from a technology perspective. So this year we're seeing a lot of, a lot, a lot around AI, <laughs> as you can imagine, and other types of sort of transformational technologies. We see a lot in cybersecurity. There was a report that really was released, I think it was by Microsoft in partnering with McKinsey a couple of years ago that was talking about the significant amount of, it's going to be something like, and I'll totally mess up the numbers here, but let's just say for the numbers, there's going to be like a billion unfilled positions in technology over the next 10 years. And they are in cybersecurity, they're in AI technology or data science, they're in basic front end and back end software engineering. And what's interesting is a significant amount of technologies probably have not been invented today that are going to be in demand 10 years from now. And it's so mind blowing. Yeah. So <laughs> it's this, hard to wrap your head around. That. Right. Right. So this whole concept of you go to school and then you go to work, like that doesn't exist anymore. Right. Like that's obvious, but that's, that's in motion now. Like, like if you're not reskilling yourself from a technology perspective, like, okay. So I know you said the last five podcasts you've been talking about AI, et cetera, but like, it's going to fundamentally change the way we work. And I don't, 
I'm not sure I believe it's going to completely disrupt all the work. I think it's going to be a significant assistance and time saver and automation piece. So for example, if you needed to uh, write a job description, why would you ever write a job description? Just look it up on chat. I mean, you're going to get immediately one written from that perspective. But understanding understanding how to do that, understanding how that technology works, understanding how it fits together, you know, that's skills that you may not have needed five years ago on being in HR or people a leader. Now you need it. So everyone has to reskill themselves. And so yeah, I, that's what we see. I was, I've, I spent some time, geez, it was probably like three or four months ago when the, the layoffs really started accelerating throughout high tech and just more broadly, the history around like trends I've seen in downturns in the past. Cause I remember everything you were describing about eBay and Yahoo, like that, that was, I remember all of that. So there's always in, I was walking Daniel through like, you know, what have those trends looked like and what, what have I seen? And there's always, um, at least the last two downturns there has been, and, and I'm excluding COVID um, because I think that was like an isolated event specific to a very specific thing. There's always, you always know something is coming when you start seeing talent acquisition and team members being laid off because there's this recognition like, oh, we're not going to be hiring. So why, so why are we keeping our recruiters? And you, you see it through that cycle. There's always buzz around tools that can help HR scale with much lower headcount. And this time around, it seems to be all focused on AI. So the number of, of AI tools and recruiting platforms, we've been getting requests of people wanting to get on the show to talk about the great tools that they have. And we've noticed that it's like, you know, again, three months ago, we weren't seeing a lot of activity and a lot of buzz around AI, but it seems like that has picked up. And I'm just curious, in addition to what you've mentioned, do you think there are any other aspects of HR that are ripe for kind of disruption with AI? Absolutely. You know, I, I think that with the success of the recent product releases, et cetera, and it's so much in the news now, it's become hot again. You're you're very right, but it's definitely been something that's been, that's we've seen for a long time at Coursera where people are trying to, trying to pivot towards that perspective. So what are some examples that are going to change? Well, we talked a little bit about, you talked a little bit about recruiting, but wow, how much is that going to change in the future? Like, and what is that going to look like? And what is the technology going to look like? But also I, I really grew my career as an HR business partner is what it was called back in the day. Mm -hmm. And one of the best things that you do as an HR business partner is you coach and guide leaders. And the other day I started getting on, on an, an AI tool and just started pulling up like, oh, just to see what it would say. Hey, I have to deliver some difficult news to our employee. How should I do it? Exactly what I would have said. Wow. And How so, cool. and so I think that, um, I, does that eliminate an HR business partner function? No, I don't think so. But it, what it does, especially with the companies that can embrace the technology, train it in their culture and, and get it from that perspective, I think getting in consistent feedback that managers are more comfortable with, like they don't want to feel judged by another person on asking a stupid question or silly question, but that you can test things with. So I think coaching and guidance and directing from that perspective is going to be a big thing that no one's thinking about disrupting right now, especially as you think about it on a learning platform. Forever, we've said, okay, we're going to do a training. Let's practice how to give difficult news. We'll put three people together in a group and two people role play and one person give feedback. Well, the chat can do that now for you. We had right? a... You can ask that question and you can do that. So I think that's going to be majorly disruptive. Of course, all the predictive measurements are going to become even more intense as well, right? So predicting like, what are the characteristics of someone who's engaged, who's not in engaged within the company, who's thinking about leaving, who's thinking about being promoted, who's silent and quitting or, you know, or, or et cetera. Like any of those pieces are going to be really big. Um, so like I could go on and on and on, but I think it's going to be across every part of what we do. And I, I think I'm really excited about it too. Me too. On the on the coaching point, I think it was Josh Burson who we recently had on who who said one day we're going to be able to basically upload all of the best coaching advice from the best coaches 
and give it to employees. And they can ask any question to this AI coach and it be able to spit out an answer. Now, I'm 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 so excited to see what what comes out here in the next five ten years. And this this you know you have you have you can train this technology right. So you know the secret is how do you make that those answers connect to what you want your culture to be, which can be this subtle piece of where you're going with it. But I think if you train that over time, which is very possible to do, it's really powerful. So cool. And I'm so curious to see where the future, and I think in the future for this wave of, or this HR tech cycle that will have these stronger AI tools, I think it's going to be a lot shorter than some of the other HR tech cycles that we've had, but we'll see how it all plays out. And so we, we want to talk a little bit about shop. And so how big is the HR team at the people team at Coursera? Yeah, so Coursera is about 1,200, almost 1,300 employees. We have 70, 75 people on the people team. So we call it the people and places team. It includes all of our workplace experiences teams or our people experiences teams, as well as we have a social impact team that's part of that group as well. So that that's a sizable team. And I'm yeah. curious, how do you keep all of your employees on the people team mm. rowing in the same direction? and and I'll have some follow-up questions from there, but I'm just curious, how have you found the right rhythms and the right approach to really drive kind of alignment and effectiveness within within the people team? Well, you know, what, what one of the things that attracted me to Coursera, when I joined Coursera, we were a little over 300 employees, a little over 100 million in revenue. So pretty, pretty small startup at that time. And, but yet the leadership team had established a cadence and a cadence is incredibly important to running a business. And so that's, that's what I found in other companies that I think have been very successful as well Is there's a routine cadence to how you operate. So the world is chaotic. Life is chaotic. Technology changes everything. But what you can count on is in April, we talk about strategy in May, you know, so that you can count on how you think about running the business. And so the best way that I work with the team to keep everyone rolling in the same direction is We are very methodical on setting quarterly OKRs, saying how we did against those OKRs, aligning resources against them. We have an annual strategy process that we look at. We have a three-year strategy process that we look at. And we also have a what what some companies call an Oregon talent review, but we call it a workforce visioning process to say, what's the organizational capabilities, skills, structures, leadership skills that we need, et cetera, to operate in the business that we want to operate over time. So we do those all on a regular basis, which is how we keep ourselves in line. So so more than anything else, we use cadence to do that. We do a significant amount of communications. I'm out talking to people all the time, but so are the leaders on the team. And that's within our own organization, but we also do that. We spend a lot of time with that as a company as well. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge believer in those operational rhythms and the cadences and there's no, it always surprises me when I meet with, with just friends and family, just people out in the wild that, and we're talking about work and they don't understand the details of what's happening with their team or other teams, just because the way that I've operated at Workify is that we have daily standups and we have ways of, of staying in sync. And, you know, I am, I don't know what it what your response is, but for me, it's like, wow, this is crazy that there are so many companies that still haven't found a way to keep their people teams kind of synchronized and and marching, like I said earlier, in the same direction. So love to hear that you guys are doing that. And I'm just curious, are there any initiatives that you guys have planned for first half a year that that you can share with us that you're excited about? Yeah, we're um, one thing that I'm really excited about is again uh, going back to this concept of customer zero. So one of our big big things that we have on our platform is a leadership academy. Now, um, and this is a story I'll tell from my days at Yahoo. You know, it it used to be if you wanted to drive transformation or increase skills in certain areas for your leadership teams across the company, it could take multiple years. Here's an example. At one point when I was at Yahoo, one of the six CEOs that I was with, got all the leaders, the top leaders in the company together in an offsite for a couple of days when we talked about our strategy, our culture, and how we were going to be successful moving forward. 
it was a great, one of those great meetings that you have where everyone's like, this is fantastic. So the ask from that meeting was, we need every manager in the company to go through that experience. The people team got together and said, okay, if we need to do that in person and people are all over the world, we'll be able to complete that in the next two years, right? By the time we got through with that, there was a new CEO, like things had changed, right? So it was way too Sounds slow. familiar, yeah. Right? So, right? And so um, what things like the Leadership Academy do, it's a set of skills that we have put together that we think make a fantastic leader, what leaders need to do. And by the way, you can change it by company, by company, but it's a set of key skills that you want to have that people can take as part of, as part of their curriculum that they take online at skill up. And then what we're going to be doing is bringing in-person experiences together. And we're going to have a full leadership meeting week in March where people, the price of admission of that is to take some of these courses. And then we're going to be practicing them for lack of a term, we're going to be utilizing them in person to sort of gain those skills over with in person. And so it's literally, we're doing online instruction with cohorts in person. And so I'm super excited about doing that. The one other, what other way you can think about it, if, if, you know, if you grew up in the university setting is, you know, you're, you're taking the courses you're taking is the big lecture hall where there's 400 people, and then you get mm -hmm. to go to your lab and do that. And so we're doing that across the entire company of all of our leaders within our company. It's like 140 leaders are coming together in March. And that's the very first time we've ever done that with the Leadership Academy. And so we're really excited about kicking that off. Sounds very, very cool. And so let's fast forward. It's mid-December, 2023. Everyone is about to take off for the holidays. You're feeling really good about the year. The people team, you crushed all of your your goals and all the expectations you had have been met. You know, give us a peek inside your brain as kind of you think about this scenario and what are some of the things your team, you know, has accomplished? What are some of those key things that you guys, that the team has done that really drove, drove you to success? Well, one of the metrics we'll be looking at is the improvement of our engagement scores over time as well as the improvement of how people feel they can they can develop their career over time. So those are two big metrics that we look at. We have a, a employee pulse surveys to measure that. And the initiatives and the things that we need to execute on to achieve that are centered in a couple areas. One is I talked about Leadership Academy, but we've coined that internally as the year of the manager. That's how you scale. Like your experience as, like think about it, your experiences as an employee, unless you're in a small two-person company, is really centered around your manager. Like that's the person who designs a lot of the experiences that you have. And so, so we think we can, we can scale the engagement of our company by, by really helping our managers be more and more effective. So there are, there's this leadership academy that we're doing. We're also going to be putting together a complete management curriculum for all our employees, creating potentially badges that people can earn from that perspective, doing development plans for our more senior levels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a big focus on management and executing on management training. The second one is around this employee connections piece that I talked about in the beginning, um, personal connections. So, you know, we did um, in 2021 and 2022, we did fly people in to, to locations and said, okay, let's have big events and let's pull people together. We found them, although some like them, they never changed the needle on people's feeling about personal connections. And so in-person offsites, in my humble opinion, are infrequent, expensive, and ineffective. I mean, agreed. Totally right? agree. Yeah. And I don't know how you scale them. I mean, um, exhausting think, as well. Yeah. They're totally exhausting. So we came up with, okay, there is, it makes a lot of sense for brought for leadership teams to get together to talk about strategy and other pieces. And it makes sense. So we have the leadership's teams getting together, but we're driving lo local connections. And so, as I mentioned, the first time we are attempting to do something, local connect connections was getting people into these rework spaces, but we're going to, we're, we need to execute on significantly more local events that are, don't take a lot of time, but get people together so they have connections with other Corsarians, as well as help to connect them from a cultural perspective. And so that's another thing we want to execute on is, is from that perspective is, is really making sure that um, uh, we're helping people connect and, you know, helping people be visible. That's the biggest thing to talk about, about connection strategies. What's the most important thing? So I'm the chief people officer. People see me. I have visibility in the company. And I'm not trying to be egotistical about that because that's far from what I'm saying. But like when I travel to events and I, you know, we, we, we've had a habit of going to different parts of the United States and having, we'll, we'll pull all the employees who are in that part of the United States or in the world together into like a, a bar or a, a restaurant or et cetera. And I walk around and people know me, 
just because they see me on Zoom, they say, and of course, the funniest thing is people say that, hey, Rich, you're a lot taller than you look on Zoom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so like, like that's like that, they say that. So, but you know, that means I'm visible, but the average employee who used to be a hundred percent visible when you sat in an office and I would see them all the time, they never get seen. So what we're trying to move on that piece is around employee visibility. Like I am seen, I belong and I'm seen and I contribute here. And I think when we think about personal connections, that's what's been missing. And so executing our strategies to help on that area and make progress there is number two. The, the third thing is, um, uh, is what I talked about a lot today, which is executing our customer zero strategies. Because you know us demonstrating that our products will help us scale, it demonstrates and helps the success of the business which by the way, the biggest thing that we can do from a company perspective to increase engagement over time in any company I've ever been with is company performance, right? And being successful and productive as employees is a huge part of what drives our satisfaction and engagement as well. So that's kind of what I'll look at. No, I love it. I, and well, first of all, kudos to you, Rich, and thank you for, because Daniel and I are kind of tenacious in these conversations. We we want we want you to, to let us in a little bit deeper and just kind of open up to, to a little bit more transparency into exactly what's going on. And you, you gave, I love the detail um, that you gave us, because I think that's what's so helpful to the other modern people leaders out there listening to this show is like, everyone's struggling with connection. So what are the real kind of creative ways and how, how, what are the practical ways that we can start creating these opportunities for our employees? And I think that that is so smart, um, how you guys are approaching creating these opportunities for employee connection. I'm just curious, like, how do you, how will you measure that? Have you guys thought through, okay, there's engagement, of course, and there's the poll surveys, and we're going to look at that data as well. Is there an employee lens that you can look at? I know that can be difficult and tricky with anonymous feedback, but I'm just curious, how can you look at that holistically to make sure that, okay, yeah, we are really moving the needle here? Yeah, I, that's a great question. You know, um, I think I saw a message the other day from Ashley Goldsmith, who's the chief people officer at Workday around, they, they do a poll, employee pulse survey every week. Wow. And it, it was pretty amazing, actually. I, I was, I was blown away and it, they don't ask everyone every time, but they have got the technology down. So they have a heartbeat of what's going on every week. And, you know, you know, when you're traveling or maybe you're in, and you go in, you're traveling in, in international airports and you walk out of the restroom and there's a little, how's the restroom experience? There's like a little, like I almost envision like smiley face. That every, yeah, right. The little yeah, smiley face. Yeah. <laughs> I almost envision you have, you, we should be doing that every day as an employee. Like, this is how I feel today. So, so uh, what we're going to, what we really been focused on and the, and the, the team that's working on it within Coursera is we're going to focus on, on a, on a scientific basis, gathering data using employee pulse survey technology, but not to everyone every week to see how people are feeling from connection points. And we're still experimenting. There are some teams that are going to do some in-person offsites and we're going to see, was that, how did that do versus these connection ones that we're doing? So that's one way we're going to measure it. But I think that honestly, the, 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 we were talking about before AI technology and how do we, how do we use, if I'm going to these events, I'm more in favor of progressing or I'm more engaged or I'm being more productive or et cetera. If we can start to paint it to those perspectives using different types of technology, I think that would be even more powerful. We're not there yet at Coursera. Let's be fair. We're not there yet, but I think that's where that will end up. Before I hand over to Daniel to, to kind of bring us to a close, from your seat as the chief people officer, having been through multiple downturns and, and economic cycles, what challenges do you feel may be lurking around the corner? What are some of the things that, you know, your spidey sense is like, oh, I'm not really concerned about this today, but in a couple quarters, I may be you know, more concerned about. I think internal mobility and career development, because, you know, what, what I've heard it described in multiple different forums, the hunker down job. Have you, have you heard that one recently? Like, it, like <laughs> yeah, it's time to hunker down because I don't want to get laid off. Okay. So, you know, people are, I believe people probably appropriately are going to be less mobile outside of their companies, given the uncertainty of what you would be going to, et cetera. And so I think that 
that still means you have to engage and, and, and get employees excited about being with the company. And the best way to do that, other than, of course, having great success, being rewarded, is how do you develop your career? Am I developing my career? You know, um, when I was at Yahoo, we had terrible results for five of the six years that I was there. But my career growth was the biggest growth that I've ever experienced in my life during that period of time. And I was excited about being there and excited about being a part of the change. And so there's definitely, if, 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 if I didn't have mentors there that were helping me, if I wasn't getting really interesting opportunities, I probably wouldn't have stayed. And so I think career development and growth is going to be, you know, um, incredibly important. The second thing that I would say is um, making sure, you know, we have to be very careful about the pendulum swinging back on the war for talent. So, you know, we, over the last several years, it's almost like we do anything to hire an employee. <laughs> we'll give you any amount of compensation. We'll give you any type of benefit, you et cetera. Now you're starting to see companies start to swing that back and you have to come back into the office. Oh, we're not, not going to do as much perks. We're not going to do this, et cetera. I still think we still need to realize that the war for talent is real. In fact, I heard a joke the other day that said the war for talent is over and talent won. So, <laughs> you know, like it's real. Like there's still a huge shortage of skills. That's, yeah. that's not, especially in skills that are transformational and technology-based skills, which is what we're, what the company I'm working with is de dealing with, of course. And that's not going to change. Like the, there's not all of a sudden going to be a surplus of AI data scientists on the market that we can pick and choose from. So we're going to have to engage and make sure that we are creating really good environments for people to work in during this period of time. So I, I worry, you know, if you're a, if you're a, I don't know, if you're a company like Coursera, which is, you know, a half a billion dollar company um, with, you know, 12, 1300 employees, you have to differentiate yourself in certain ways to get people to want to stay here. And and creating negative environments where you're pulling people back into the office or forcing them to do things that they want to do, that's not going to play at, at a company our size. And so that's one, one thing to sort of keep our eye on as well. On the career development piece, so my wife, she's a machine learning engineer, and um, they just started a women in tech mentorship program at her company, and it's cohort-based. And uh, this is like the most excited I've seen her in the last you know couple of years. And I think you're right. I think people are excited to, to learn and to grow and I'm excited for her. And uh, I know that a lot of other people out there listening to this would be excited if their company took the time to invest in, in their career, their growth as well. So I, I wish we could keep talking about this stuff, but we only have like four or five minutes. So I'm going to, I'm going to take us into the rapid fire questions. So we have a few questions for you. So question one, how do you define a modern people leader? What are the traits and characteristics? You know, um, I think I, th I think this is, while it's, it's this a modern way of viewing it, I think it's pretty consistent over the years. A modern people leader has to build talent. They have to think strategically. They need to drive excellence and they need to champion collaboration. That's a large part of what we've been tasked to do over my time. And so I think that's a large part of what we do now. Under the build talent, there's a huge piece of empathy. That is a big difference. And if I want to say what changed over most of this stuff over time is this real need to be em empathetic um, as a leader and, and, and to be open about who you are. I, I was coached in early on in my career is don't talk about your personal life. Don't share personal things. No one wants, you know, it's, it's, it's not the right thing to do. Now it's expected. Yeah. People understand that. Right. And, and that's actually, I'm much more comfortable with, with sharing but that's what that's the way I was coached. Interesting enough. Yeah, I uh, I had a prep call with one of our guests that we're gonna have on in a couple of months, and I think the way that she put it is that leaders are having to level up their consciousness in order to like figure out like who they are authentically. How can they present that person to their employees? Because that's what that's what people are looking for these days. They want to connect, and um, yeah, I think that's that's great advice for the people leaders out there. All right. So if you could go back in time and talk to a 22 year old you, what career advice would you give yourself and why? Don't be afraid to do things outside of HR to develop your career. Boom. Like, yeah, period. I think that the, the thing that makes great HR leaders and people leaders is understanding the business. And there's no better way to understand a business than to work in different parts of it. Love it. All right. 
Last question for rapid fire questions. If you could fix any HR or people problem with a magic wand, what would it be and why? Entitlement. <laughs> you know, um, uh, one of the biggest questions that I heard my colleagues talk about and I saw as well during, during the lockdown and pandemic that technology le HR leaders were getting from their teams was, are you all going to pay for my lunch? Because it, I have to pay for lunch at home. And that sort of just rings of at the time, of course, it's a very fair question. And, and it was you know challenging for people's pocketbooks, right? They weren't used to paying for lunch because they would come into work. But there's a significant amount of people around the world who lost their jobs who service <laughs> that place, right? And, and so the answer was no. So I think that we have to balance empathy, competing for talent with this concept of entitlement where we, ha we have to be accountable for what we're delivering and it is a business. And the business is around, you know, we, we are a mission-driven B Corp. So we are around doing more than just profit. But at the end of the day, it is still a business that we have to operate and we have to do the right things from that perspective. And so to me, that would be the one, if I had to wave my wand, it would be that we could take entitlement out of any workforce. I'm going to have to oh go and, and re-listen to the Katie Burke episode, but I'm almost, I'm like 90% sure that, that her response was very similar. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I've heard Katie speak before. I, I, we have a lot of similar thoughts, I would say. And so, um, yeah, that it, entitlement is just it, immediately when you said that, that's what came to mind. And with that, I almost caught myself launching into talk about entitlement, but we're unfortunately rich. We're at the end of our time. Um, you know, we've been extremely fortunate to have amazing guests like you mainly through organic kind of word of mouth and, and or recommendations that we've gotten from from the the guests that we've had on the show. And so we always ask the question, if there's one brilliant people mind out there that you feel has to be heard that we absolutely should include on the show, who should we, who is that person? Off the top of my head, uh, David Winley, who was okay. the chief people officer at Yahoo when I was there, was a strong mentor of mine. And is doing some interesting work, you know, and, and the broader thought I would have is um, there's a lot of really great introverted people leaders out there who want nothing to do with talking publicly or doing fantastic work and getting people like that on. I mean, I'm actually an introvert. There's a great TED talk about the power of the introvert, but there's a lot of people doing fantastic work who aren't as comfortable about sort of talking publicly that I think we all can learn it so much from around how doing it. So not that David's necessarily an introvert. I'm not trying to call him out on any way, shape or form, but I think he would be a great guest. Another great guest I would say is Beth Axelrod, who I think is taking time off, but was the chief people officer at eBay and then went on to Airbnb. Love it. He also and was I, a co-author of the War for Talent book when she was at McKinsey. So she might be amazing too. I would have never guessed based on this conversation, Rich, that you're an introvert at all. And so that's my uh, my surprise for uh, for for the ending of this show. But we'll definitely reach out to David and Beth. And if we ever have tentative people that you know are nervous about joining us, hopefully we can get a recommendation from you that uh, that we will be will be gentle in the process uh, in the conversation. Yeah, just remember, I totally will. Just remember, it's not that introverts can't do things publicly. It just takes a lot of energy. It's draining. I, yeah. yeah, I, I yeah. get it. I get yeah. it. And so with that, we're at the final tradition of the modern people leader. We like to end with a one word or one phrase close that um, is a thought or feeling that uh, that you're taking away from this conversation. Who wants to, who wants to start? I did a lot of talking. You all want to try first? I, I can go. I'll say learn. That's good. And and mine, I think, is going to be, you just gave us so many, uh, you lobbed so many softballs. I'm going to go with skill up because it's not something I think enough about is my own education. And, you know, the older I get, the more um, interest I have and just finding the time is just so hard. So, so that's kind of what I'm leaving with is skilling up and investing more time there. You know, the, the word that I'm using and I've been using this word for how I'm thinking about 2023 is perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we have all, we have so much positive things that we're able to do because I'm privileged to work in a, 
technology company that's working on changing the world. And I've got opportunity to talk to you all and to influence people's lives and work at a company and get paid for it, et cetera. I mean, all that's a, like perspective of what else is going on in the world and things that people are going through. And, um, you know, it's just honor and gratitude to be a part of a company that's trying to help. So to me, perspective. Amazing. Well, Rich, such a great conversation. Thank you for being so candid and letting us uh, throw some curveball questions at you. It was an absolute blast. So thanks again. Cool. It was awesome to meet you too. Likewise. All right. Bye, Have guys. a good week. Bye.